Hello Advanced Physics, this is Dr. Brinzi here and this is the Lesson 7.5 video. We started on this in class yesterday and I want to review a little bit of it and then finish up with an example that I didn't get to in class. And that should set you up to be able to do the 7.5 practice once you're done watching this video. So to review, what is angular momentum first of all? Uh, angular momentum is like the angular equivalent of linear momentum. Um, we determined that linear momentum is mass times velocity, and we learned that back in Unit 4. And we learned that there are some things that are special about momentum, like that it's conserved in situations, in certain situations like collisions. Um, and you can calculate that momentum by taking its mass times its velocity. Oops, got to get my air out here. Uh, its mass times its velocity. And the units for momentum are the units of mass times the units of velocity. Something that's rotating has what we call angular momentum in physics. So if we have some rigid body like a rod that is rotating around its center, then it will have what we call angular momentum. And the way we figure out angular momentum is we multiply rotational inertia times angular speed. Just like for linear momentum, we multiplied inertia, which is mass, times velocity or times speed. The units for angular momentum are the units of, ang uh, of rotational inertia, which are kilograms meters squared. So we have kilograms meters squared here, times the units for angular speed, which are radians per second. But the radians we leave out because, in a sense, they are what we call in physics a placeholder unit. So when there is... Um, when things get too crowded with all the units, we actually drop the radians, let's put it that way. So the units for angular momentum are kilograms meters squared per second. And then we learned that there are situations in which uh, momentum is conserved, or, um, or we recalled that, excuse me, we actually learned that back in unit four. Uh, Linear momentum is conserved when there are no net external forces acting on a system. Likewise, angular momentum is conserved when there is no net external torque acting on the system. So if you have a system of uh, objects that are spinning and you do not apply any external torque to those objects, then this value of angular momentum is conserved. Um, you can see this in real life by actually looking at a figure skater. And I showed a video in class of that figure skater. And if you want to view that again, you can go to this link that I have on the slide there. But the idea was is that the skater started with her arms and her legs extended. Actually, one leg extended. And we noticed that when she had her arms and leg extended, she spun slowly, so she had a low angular speed. So she started off with a very big rotational inertia because rotational inertia is how much mass you have and how far you are away from the axis of rotation. So these arms cause a big rotational inertia which means she has a low value of angular speed, so she spins slowly. When she pulls her arms in, on the other hand, we notice that she started to increase her angular speed. That's because she is conserving angular momentum, so this value hasn't changed, but her rotational inertia is now much lower because now her arms are close to the axis of rotation, and that in turn results in an increased angular speed, so she spins faster. So that's an example of where angular momentum is conserved in physics. 
And there are lots of other examples out there, and you're going to learn some of them when you do your practice problems. So let's actually do an example, another example, where angular momentum is conserved. Oops, I got to drawing here a little bit. But anyway, uh, let's say that we have a 0 0.5 kilogram disc that I've drawn here. It has a radius of 0.25 meters, and it's rotating at an angular speed of... 30 radians per second. A ball of clay, and I need to give you the mass of that ball of clay. So let's call this a 0 0.1 kilogram ball of clay. That will be given to you in the problem. That should be. And without that information, we can't actually solve this problem. So a 0 0.1 kilogram ball of clay is dropped onto the spinning disk. The ball sticks to the outer edge of the disc, and we have to figure out what is the new angular speed of this combined disc and ball stuck to it. Okay, so we have an event happening, which means it's a good idea to draw a before picture and an after picture. So I accidentally started on the before picture here. I drew a disc, and it tells us a 0 0.5 kilogram disc, so... Let's put 0 0.5 kilograms there. It says it has a radius of 0.25 meters, so let's label that. And it says it's rotating freely at 30 radians per second. And we're going to infer that it rotates around its center there. And then we have a 0 0.1 kilogram ball of clay that we have to drop on this spinning disk. So that green dot is our ball of clay, and it uh, has 0 0.1 kilograms of mass, but it's not doing any spinning. We're, we haven't dropped it yet. Okay, so that's an, a picture of what happens before. And then what does the system look like afterward? Well, we, have a, we still have a spinning disk. So let's draw that disk again. It's spinning. Uh, but now we have a ball of clay stuck to the outside rim, or the outside edge, it says here. So let's assume that it sticks to the outside edge. And that is going to cause the angular speed to change. So we have to calculate that new angular speed. Now we can immediately think to ourselves, um, if we add more mass to this disk, uh, what do we think is going to happen to this angular speed? Do we think adding more mass is going to increase this angular speed? Or do we think it's going to decrease this angular speed? Well, if we think about angular momentum, that is I times omega. So if we're adding more mass to the system, we're adding more rotational inertia, which means we're increasing the value of I, and that should decrease the value of omega. So we should expect a value of omega that is smaller than what we started off with. Let's go through the calculation and actually see if that's what we get. Okay, now uh, you don't have to clear everything. You don't have to like erase this drawing in your notes, but I have to go on to a new slide here. So I am uh, going to just put that up here in the corner. It's the same figure you just drew. And let's go ahead and um, we got to figure out the angular momentum of the clay and the ball before this collision happened. Uh, the clay is not spinning. So we can say that its angular momentum is zero. The angular momentum of the disk is its moment of inertia times omega, uh, which means I need to figure out the angular momentum, or excuse me, um, I need to figure out the moment of inertia for the disk, which means I have to go to my uh, chart that shows moments of inertia and look up a disk and when I looked that up, it turns out that a disk has a moment of inertia of one-half mr squared. 
And uh, let's plug in the mass. Let's plug in the radius of this disk. All right, so it has a mass of 0.5 kilograms, radius of 0.25 meters squared. And when I evaluate that, I end up with a number of 0 0.0156 kilogram meters squared. Okay, so that's the number I'm going to plug in for I right here. And then it tells me omega. It tells me it's spinning at a rate of 30 radians per second. So when I multiply those two numbers together, I get 0 0.469 kilograms meters squared per second. Okay, so the total angular momentum of the system is this plus that. So the total angular momentum before the event happened is this number right here. Now I have to figure out the total angular momentum after the collision, after the ball is dropped onto the disk. And let's figure that out. Okay, so I'm going to make a little dividing line here, and um, let's write down the formula for angular momentum. L equals I times omega. And I have to be aware that uh, when I'm calculating the moment of inertia of this new system, I have to add the moment of inertia of the disk plus the moment of inertia of the clay that's sitting on the outside. Now, I calculated the moment of inertia for the disk already, but what about the moment of inertia of this ball of clay that is stuck to the outside of the disk? Well, whenever we're going to treat it like a point mass. We're going to treat it as though it is a point mass with a mass m, and it is a distance d away from the axis of rotation. So this distance is d. And that distance happens to be the same as the radius of the disk. So I can take the mass of the clay, which is 0 0.1 kilograms, multiply it times the radius of the disk squared, and I get the moment of inertia for the clay of 0 0.0625 kilograms meter squared. Now, if I want to figure out uh, the total moment of inertia, I total, I have to add these two numbers, that plus this. And when I do that, oh, actually, I decided to write that down. When I do that, I get uh, this expression right here. I get 0 0.0781 times omega. Okay. Okay, so I figured out the total angular momentum of the system before the disc or the ball was dropped, and then I figured out the total angular momentum after the ball was dropped. Now what do I need to do? Well, now I need to use conservation of angular momentum to set these two things equal to one another. The total angular momentum is the same before and after the event. I need, obviously need a little bit more room, so I need to make a new slide. You don't need to write anything new here. This is all from before. So this is kind of like the, la the last two things that we wrote. So before, here's our total angular momentum. And then after the event, here's our total angular momentum. Now we set these two equal to one another by using conservation of angular momentum. So I can say 0 0.469 equals this expression over here. Okay. Now I have an equation I can solve for the angular speed after the event, after the ball was dropped. So I solve that and I figured out that the angular speed of the disk and the ball after the event, after the ball is dropped, is 6.00 radians per second. Okay, now that I have an answer, let's see if that um, answer makes sense, if it's reasonable. We predicted at the very beginning, when we were, after we drew our diagram, 
that if we add more mass to this disk, then we should slow the disk down. Okay, is that what we came up with? We started off with an angular speed of 30 radians per second and slowed down to an angular speed of 6 radians per second. So that does seem to be reasonable, all right? Okay, so this looks like a reasonable answer. And this is how you could apply conservation of angular momentum to uh, physical situations where you're either adding or taking away mass or you're somehow changing an object's moment of inertia. All right, so now you have an opportunity to practice um, the Lesson 7.5 practice, and I uh, wish you the best of luck with it. We'll take a look at it when we have an opportunity to meet um, tomorrow. All right, have a good one. Bye.